Good morning and welcome to this morning's meeting. I've received no apologies for today's meeting. This morning we'll take evidence on Audit Scotland's NHS in Scotland 2021 report and we have with us the Auditor General for Scotland and supporting officials. Um, the first item on our agenda before we get to that though is to take items, decision to make to items five and six in private and whether to hold our next meeting on the 26th of April in private. Our members agreed to that. And our second item today is an evidence session, as I said, with the Audit Scotland's NHS, uh, NHS in Scotland 2021 report. And welcome to the committee, Stephen Boyle, the Auditor General for Scotland. Good morning to you. Nice to have you here in person. And uh, online, we've got uh, supporting uh, Mr Boyle, we've got Derek Hoy, the Audit Manager, and Lee Johnson, Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. Um, and I invite the Auditor General to give a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Committee. Delighted to be with you this morning. My report on the NHS in Scotland for 2021 uh, turns our attention to the recovery and remobilisation of NHS services while acknowledging that it remains under severe pressure from the pandemic and the backlog of patients that have built up over the past two years. The NHS, at the time of the publication of our report, was on an emergency footing, and the path of the pandemic remained unpredictable, and I think it's fair to say it's likely that it still, still does. The Scottish Government and the NHS are planning the recovery from the pandemic, but the scale of the backlog of patients will make this challenging. The NHS also needs to reform Services were already delivered in an unsustainable way before the pandemic. And the Scottish Government must therefore focus on transforming health and social care services to address the growing cost of the NHS, together with supporting its recovery from COVID-19. This will be very difficult against competing demands of the pandemic and an increasing number of other policy initiatives, including plans for a national care service. The innovation we've seen during the course of the pandemic shows that positive change can happen quickly and effectively. And this momentum has now to be maintained. The Scottish Government has published its NHS recovery plan last year and is also developing a care and wellbeing portfolio within the Scottish Government that is expected to provide a strategic direction for reform, but it also needs to involve the public in deciding how future services will be delivered. Workforce availability and workforce wellbeing are the most significant risks now to successful reform. Staff wellbeing, of course, has been hugely affected by the pandemic. And the NHS recovery plan makes ambitious commitments, placing significant asks on the workforce already suffering from both fatigue and risk of burnout. The recovery plan makes several commitments that require significant growth now in the NHS workforce on top of already uh, existing staffing commitments. A new health and social care workforce strategy was published in March. It remains the case, though, that plans to recruit staff will be challenging to achieve. And we know and have reported previously that the NHS has historically struggled to deliver all of its staffing ambitions. Finally, we highlight the uncertainty surrounding the long-term financial position of the NHS in Scotland. Under the new care and wellbeing portfolio, the Scottish Government plans to bring financial service and workforce planning together in one place. That has the potential to make the NHS more sustainable, but these plans remain at an early stage. The key to financial sustainability remains a clear focus on the Scottish Government's long-standing commitment to transform how health and social care services will be delivered together. Convener, I'm joined by my colleagues Lee Johnson and Derek Hoy from Audit Scotland, and together we look forward to answering the committee's questions this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you've, you've outlined some of the, the, the main points, the sort of like the top lines of, of the, the report in terms of the, the challenges that we know the NHS is, is facing and some of the potential um, learnings that there have been from the, the pandemic. Can you be more specific? Um, in, I mean, when you were doing your work, I mean, it's quite obvious, and a lot of what you've said and a lot of what's in the report is, is no surprise to any of us. We've been hearing this since we, we, we convened, and, and obviously but well before that, about, about the, the challenges that there are for the NHS, particularly when it's still in, this emer it's still in an emergency footing in, in most places. Given that health boards are 
responsible locally for how they manage their, their health board. Do you see that there's an opportunity here with um, some of the reforms that are taking place at national level to have some of the, the health boards that you've identified as having particular challenges brought into line with those that are, seem to be managing better? I think I'll, I'll, bring, uh, I'll bring Lee Johnson in a moment, because Lee is one of the authors of the report, actually, and particularly looking at you know, some of the forward aspects of how reform will be delivered um, in the NHS. And it is the case, I think, as you suggest, can be another, that um, there's not a uniform picture across Scotland either. That, and through some of Audit Scotland's reporting over many years, we have produced what we call st Section 22 reports, statutory reporting, um, on a number of health boards that highlight some of the challenges of those boards, whether those are in terms of leadership, financial position or, or governance matters. Um, there has been some consistency, if I can put it in those terms, of which boards have been in that bracket and which and those that haven't. Um, in terms of the reform, that's one of the key planks that we make in the report, that rather than looking to recover to what we think was an already unsustainable position, both in some local context across health boards and, and more nationally, the opportunity for the government to grasp reform. And in the report, um, we highlight some of the examples that we've seen over the course of the pandemic, but they need to galvanise those on a consistent basis and spread that learning and innovation across all of the areas of Scotland and all, all of those services. And we point to the ambitions, I think, particularly around the care and wellbeing portfolio to give the government some of the strategic capacity that it's looking to, to generate some of that consistency of experience. Um, if I may convene, I'd like to bring Lee in just to say about some of the lessons learned and how that um, good practice and some of the forward thinking is being developed. Thank you. I'll bring in Lee, Lee Johnson. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think in terms of you, were, you uh, talked about the, the boards that, that, that we've identified that are getting additional support from Scottish Government that, ha that have been struggling. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, across the board, a number of um, the boards are struggling in terms of um, their financial position going forward, um, in terms of um, their the efficiency savings that they've been making. There hasn't been a focus on that throughout the pandemic. And obviously, the Scottish Government has um, funded the unachieved savings um, and also fully funded um, the, all of the NHS boards uh, throughout the pandemic. So as we move forward, um, we need to um, see the more medium term and longer term financial planning be coming back into place so that we can fully understand um, the future financial position of those boards. But I do think there is um, opportunities across the board, as you as you said, convener, in terms of the innovation that we've seen throughout the pandemic. For example, things like Near Me um, and the opportunities that that um, offers, particularly some of our more rural um, NHS boards, um, in terms of trying to uh, provide services that are more accessible um, for people within those areas, but also um, enable them to um, deliver more affordable services as well, I think. Mm -hmm. And one thing, Lee, as, as you were mentioning near me there, um, and, and, and maybe something that Stephen wants to come in as well, we've been hearing quite a lot in some of our other inquiry work around patient expectation. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, in, in terms of the, the work you did and the scope of the work you did and who you spoke to, if, if that really came out. I mean, obviously, we have had historic issues with, you know, waiting lists, particularly for elective surgeries, for example. Um, but given that we've got an, we're still in an emergency footing we have still had some some backlogs even hung over from pre-pandemic um did patient expectation did that come up a lot in, in the work that you did when you were speaking to to the people that you 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 spoke to in the, the course of your inquiry um i think as we've clearly set out in our report that it's very important that the patient is at the center of any um, changes in the way that services are delivered, um, both that they have a say um, and in terms of what their priorities are going forward, but also as those services change and the way services are delivered, that they, that's clearly communicated um, to the public um, as well. Um, I think what we did see is obviously there has been um, uh, an evaluation of near me 
Um, and that was clearly one of the findings is that it doesn't suit everybody, for example, that type of um, service delivery, if you like, um, and that there has to be a choice going forward as well. Um, I think it does suit some people, but obviously then we get into all the questions around digital inclusion um, and obviously some of our um, more vulnerable um, members of the population also still want to have that face-to-face -face, uh, contact with their health healthcare. Um, but I, I think one of our key messages in our report is that patients and the public need to be at the centre of any service changes going forward. And once those changes are implemented, that that all needs to be clearly communicated so that people are very clear about how they can access services going forward. Thank you. Stephen, did you want to yeah, just add anything? <clears throat> Thanks, Katrina. Just briefly, I, I think for absolute clarity, we, we didn't interview members of the public in, in terms of... Uh, uh, compiling a report drawn from a range of sources and um, interviews with uh, health board officials, government officials, review of evidence, um, and so forth. Um, but I think Lee strikes on the main point, effectively, that as all of the innovations that have you know, identified, and we touched on some of those in Exhibit 7 of, of the report, uh, near me being a, a very clear one, we're unlikely to revert to stepping back from some of the digital technologies and we know, importantly, the government's plans for a digital strategy um, later this year, bringing in some of the data gaps about and, and evaluating all of that on a, on a regular basis. Um, and at the heart of that will be what are patients' experience and expectations um, of the services, that their voice is heard and they shape the future reform of the NHS and social care in Scotland. Thank you. That's very helpful. And, and I want to bring in some of my colleagues who've got questions around, around this. Uh, can I bring in Sue Weber? Uh, thanks, convener. Yes, uh, Mr Boyle, thank, welcome for coming along today. It's nice to see you face to face as well. It's been eight months since the Scottish Government published its NHS recovery plan. Um, and what's your assessment of progress that's been made, if any, since its publication? Um, and we all understand, and you've rightly stated, that there's no quick fix, but this is the opportunity for us to reform uh, rather than to recover to the pre-pandemic levels. But statistics coming out of the NHS when it comes to A&E, cancer, delayed discharges, diagnostics, all remain bleak. So do you think their plan is working? Good morning, Ms. Webb. I think the first thing we'd say, we'd, and I think we're very clear in the report, recognising that the NHS remains, at the time of publication, on an emergency footing. And the, the challenge of tackling the COVID pandemic was writ large whilst we were compiling our audit work. We also note that the government you know, uh, began to turn its attention to the future, the recovery and the reform, and that it has received submissions from the health boards. And I'll, and I'll turn to Lee again in a second just to say a bit more about the assessment of the, what the individual boards um, are stating. Um, our assessment on an overall basis is that it is an ambitious plan um, that will be you know, both centred on you know, recovering a backlog of services and you know in the report we we look to outline for a for a number of specialties not all if I, if I can get the exhibit correct just to set out exhibit four uh, for the committee's attention some of the impact of the pandemic you know seeing a, an, an increase in demand a reduction in activity and therefore by consequence uh, increasing weights for patients um, on top of that the committee of course will be familiar that there will be many patients who would have been anticipated to present for services who haven't. So the scale of the backlog itself also remains uncertain. Um, and our assessment, as I say, is that it is an ambitious plan centred and predicated on recruiting, training, retaining enough uh, medical nursing uh, professionals to deliver the scale of backlog um, that will be uh, needed to, to be tackled. And therefore, it's probably not possible at this stage to give a definitive position whether it's on track um, or not. I think the one note before having to, to Lee to say a bit more is that we welcome the government's commitment to publish an annual update on the progress against the recovery um, plan in terms of supporting transparency, managing patients' expectations, public scrutiny. All of that feels in, in the right place. And we also set out in the report our very clear plan to undertake further work um, in this area very likely to be part of our report on the NHS in 2022 that we'll track and monitor progress to support the committee and parliament scrutiny. But again, I'll turn to Lee if you're content just to say a bit more about the recovery plans for boards. 
Lee, can you come? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yes, again, uh, as we um, outlined in our report, I think um, the boards, um, in terms of their remobilisation plans, um, had a number of concerns um, about their ability to uh, recover and remobilise services. And I think we've seen them play out, if you like. Um, so one of the major things they were uh, worried about was um, the um, uncertainty about how the pandemic would um, continue or not. And obviously, I think kind of late summer, early autumn, the boards were starting to turn their attention to recovery. And then, of course, we saw the uh, new variant appear um, and it, it just it took their attention away. We saw the pressures that the hospitals were under with all of the winter pressures as well. And that continues as, as we speak, that those pressures are there. So it takes that focus away from that ability to remobilise. Um, I think one of the other um, issues that they were very concerned about is workforce, um, and there's a number of aspects to that. Um, both their ability to recruit um, is sufficient um, numbers, um, but also, obviously, the ongoing uh, pandemic has also affected um, the uh, the capacity of their staff because there's been high levels of sickness, um, so that has also reduced. Uh, the capacity within hospitals, as well as the ongoing um, infection control and prevention measures that they've had to have in place, that further reduces the capacity within healthcare settings to deal with um, the number of patients really that they would like to be. But I think one of the other key findings for it that we outline in our report um, is uh, the Scottish Government introduced a clinical prioritisation framework. Um, so basically, those people who were in more urgent need would be seen more quickly. Um, but we've yet to see the data from that uh, being published. We made that recommendation that we would like to see the data from that, um, both in our 2020 report and in our 2021 report. And I think it would be um, it's it it would provide transparency um, to both the public and also provide assurance about how NHS boards are dealing with the backlog of patients if we could see the data related to that clinical prioritisation framework. Thank you. Sue? Yes, uh, thank you for those uh, responses there. Um, Mr Boyle mentioned earlier, and I might not have the exact wording right, so hopefully it will give you a gist. You said that the NHS consistently failed to deliver on all of its historic staffing ambitions. And then you also stated that the new recovery plan is predicated on re recruitment, uh, retention uh, of staff. So staffing is obviously key to that. But do you get a sense, I suppose, that what the recovery plan sets out is the reform that's required? And it's not just tackling the issues that we have that are longstanding with staff, because that's quite different, you know, bringing about the reform that's needed versus tackling our recruitment challenges. I think it's a very important distinction that you make, Ash, that it's not about um, recovery to where we were before the pandemic. Um, my predecessor and, and myself, since taking on this role, have both noted that the NHS operated in an unsustainable um, financial position, service challenges, changing demographics in the country, um, and the unsustainable nature of the delivery of services. Um, the report also touched on, and I will address your, your, your very direct question, actually, is that um, the challenges in recruiting staff, um, retaining them, and to use a, the, the government's word in its own report, but nurturing the experience that people get, uh, understanding that it's been an incredibly demanding period, uh, unprecedentedly so, for NHS workers over the past two years. Um, we note the report that as you say, that the NHS has historically struggled to deliver upon its staffing commitments. Um, Exhibit 6, for example, just sets out some of the uh, challenges and aspirations in terms of the workforce that existed before the pandemic. And then in addition to that, the, some of the staffing aspirations to deliver the recovery plan. Um, so we don't yet know, I think, is, you know, is the, uh, how successful those would be. I think, as I mentioned in one of my earlier responses, is that we welcome the transparency and the commitment to publish annual progress updates. I think that's really important for parliamentary scrutiny, for the public to understand 
how progress uh, is being made. But the distinction between recovery and reform is a really vital one. And we, we look to em emphasise that in, in the report that to, if we can, I kind of hesitate to use this, but to use the opportunity to reform as we look to rebuild services. Um, and the, you know, the detail of the government's plans for a national care service will clearly be very uh, important to what reform looks like uh, in respect of both health and social care services. We do, add, we do note some caution, Ms Weber, in terms of the capacity of the NHS to deliver upon all of its ambitions for reform, while at the same time looking to rebuild and, and recover services. So we note that it's very clearly part of our ongoing work. But again, I think it's probably a bit early for us to be definitive about whether um, the government is yet in a position. And that's why, just finally, to say that the aspirations and the intention of the, the new care and wellbeing portfolio within the Scottish Government will be key. It's identified as being the, the driver, the capacity to deliver um, these reforms. So, as I know, we'll, we'll continue to work uh, in this area. Thank you. Uh, bring in Paul and then Sandesh. Paul. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the Auditor General and uh, colleagues from uh, Audit Scotland. Uh, I suppose in, in the context of social care and the National Care Service, I I'm interested about, I suppose, how these two things sit alongside one another. Um, you prepared a report in January around social care in, in which you highlighted, uh, I think, the the, the scale of the challenge in social care, and I think that sits alongside the pressures that we're seeing in the NHS. We know that delayed discharge uh, and blockages further up uh, at the other end of the scale then are caused often by a lack of availability in terms of care packages. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the sense of you said that in your January report on social care that the government needs to go faster than the five year time scale envisaged for a national care service in order to take action to perhaps alleviate some of these issues. So, so I suppose my question is, uh, is it your feeling that there are things that can be done now uh, in order to uh, alleviate the issues we're experiencing in the NHS and to provide social care more quickly? And would those be things like paying conditions of staff for the recruitment of new care staff uh, and looking at care packages across the country? Um, yes, you've, you're, you're correct in your um, analysis of the joint paper that uh, myself and the Accounts Commission published earlier this year on the challenges facing social care in Scotland. Um, and as we mentioned already this morning, and, and do so in that paper, that the ambitions around the National Care Service, you know, in whatever shape they come in and uh, how that will be delivered, um, are a number of years away. And we also highlight at the same time that there are some very severe pressures already facing Scotland's social care sector that can't wait for the structural change and... and that comes from a national care service. Um, you mentioned, Mr. O'Kane, some of the, the factors that might help alleviate that, um, whether you know fair work practices that, that build on some of the recommendations from the, the Feely review into to adult social care, but acknowledging that, that it will be difficult for those two things to, to exist about in terms of the structural change and the uh, integration of health and social care services a number of years down the line while tackling the very real challenges that exist in that sector at the moment. And of course, as you suggest, that there is, this is not a system that operates in isolation. The NHS relies upon social care to deliver um, the, uh, for all of you know, Scotland's patients. And I think if, if I, just seeing some of the, the data during the course of the pandemic in respect of delayed discharges that you mentioned, and we look to capture some of that um, in the report about a very clear reduction in delayed discharges, and I'm not drawing any conclusion about the, the appropriateness or value of that, but delayed discharges dropped um, uh, significantly in the early part of the pandemic, but we're now back up largely to where we were uh, in pre-pandemic terms. Um, I, I don't wish to underestimate the scale of the challenge, and I think I'm, I'm careful in trying not to, to do so um, about the challenge of recovery and reform and transformation. Um, but one last comment I, I would make is that um, as the committee, I'm sure, will be familiar, last year was the 10th anniversary of the, the Christie Commission report and the aspirations of that group to um, reform a more preventative-based uh, uh, care public service delivery model and really the sense of missed opportunity that hadn't um, come to fruition. Um, so we looked to set out in January's paper, again referencing that, but really highlighting the interconnectedness and the urgency of some of the uh, challenges facing Scotland's social care. 
Thank you. And Ish, um, and you also got some questions on workforce planning, so just carry on after you've asked the question on this theme. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for uh, coming. Uh, I want to turn uh, attention to long COVID, um, and I would like to ask uh, about the work that's going on at the moment uh, within NHS Scotland uh, on long COVID, um, because we've seen there are over 90 clinics in England. There are none here in Scotland, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I would like to know what, through your work, you've seen uh, for the work that's going on and how long COVID is being addressed, but then also what plans you are hearing about and seeing for long COVID clinics or long COVID treatment uh, for patients uh, as far as reform of the NHS, because this is obviously a huge area with over 100,000 Scots suffering. Yeah, good morning. We note the, uh, in the report the, the impact of long COVID, actually, and recognising that uh, the term refers to a range of factors and symptoms and the government's funding commitments. And I'll, I'll, I'll maybe bring in colleague Derek Hoy uh, in a moment to say a bit more about the longer term plans that, that the government has set out. Um, we also note, you know, as, as you suggest, the, um, the difference in scale between some of the uh, investment and plans elsewhere in the UK relative to, uh, to those in Scotland. I think it's fair to say that there is work underway at an early stage in terms of um, long COVID, um, but there's probably a limit of our ability to be um, clear about, or I say terribly much more than we have done in the report about the government's plans uh, to evaluate it, to invest further. Um, and it may be a, a line of inquiry that the committee wishes to pursue uh, with the NHS and the government um, more directly. Um, but I'll pause a moment and, say, and just invite Derek, if I may, just to say a bit more about uh, our work in this area. Derek. Thanks, Auditor General. Um, yeah, I think as as you said, there's not we didn't go into a tremendous amount of detail on long COVID in this this particular report. What we do know is there, there are basically two branches of action that Scottish government are taking just now. So they're, they're, they're funding a, a range of uh, research projects into long COVID that will also take a bit of time for um, for the results of that to come to fruition. And and as as you rightly point out, there are as far as we know, there are no specific clinics in Scotland. The, the Scottish Government has decided to take a, a different approach whereby they don't see um, a kind of one-stop shop or a, a one single approach as being the way forward. They've taken a different approach, which will be kind of more centred towards the patient and the, they expect the, the services to basically wrap around the patient. That's the kind of terminology that they've used. So it's, it's very much a different approach, I think, to what, what we're seeing in England. Also, that's a policy issue and that's that's for them to decide so we will we wouldn't want to comment on that too much but uh, so basically the, the approach seems to be that you know they'll, they'll try and deal with with long covid and um, within the, the existing scope of the services that are there rather than putting put something specific in place so that's the kind of long-term approach obviously it's, it's still at quite an early stage we'll have to see how that develops so um but yeah hopefully we'll be able to do some more or work on that in the future okay Sandesh, would thank you like you. to continue on the workforce planning issues? Absolutely, thank okay. you for that. Um, that. That is certainly very interesting and not quite what I understood to be what the plan was to happen. And I'm very interested to hear that, that long COVID is still at a very early stage. Um, moving on to workforce planning, um, in, in 2019, um, you or your predecessor pointed out that the Scottish Government's commitment to recruit 800 GPs uh, will be all but undone by people leaving the profession. Uh, so my question is, is there enough focus on retention and do we need to see more ambition uh, if we're really going to get a grip on workforce planning? You're right. Audit Scotland has produced a number of reports on the NHS workforce over the years, GPs, uh, nursing and other services. And that led us to the, the overall judgment that we make in the report, and I, and I touched on in my introductory remarks, that, that the historical struggles that the NHS has had to recruit and retain enough uh, workforce to deliver its commitments. Clearly, um, these have been compounded uh, by the pandemic. We touch on some of the fatigue and burnout experienced by uh, NHS and social care workers over the course of the past two years. And then, of course, connect that to the extent of the forward plans to recruit many more additional staff to deliver the uh, plans to tackle the backlog of patients. The, the workforce strategy um, is ambitious. 
to uh, deliver the backlog. And we, as I've mentioned already, you know, we welcome, therefore, the plans to have transparency around that so that the public the committee the parliament can track progress in a transparent way um, and we'll continue to be uh, involved in the audit work this is very clear my expectation that through our report uh, on the nhs in 2022 that we'll comment and audit and track progress against the delivery of the um, the workforce plan um, so really I, I, it's probably difficult to see terribly much more at, at this stage, noting that um, the strategy will need to be accompanied by more detail, more evidence of progress alongside both the workforce and then you know, the other significant components of that, the national treatment centres um, and other factors. Um, I'm sure the committee will want to explore it, but I, th I think it is worth pointing out that um, one of the other key planks of this is that high quality and complete data needs to be accompanied alongside that so that it is possible to track progress both in a workforce context and the delivery of services and again that remains part of our forward work Thank you. actually this was something that i did want to come on to which is it's very difficult to, to know what you need and very difficult to know what to do if not impossible if there is a lack of data when it comes to this so do you think that we're seeing progress or a lack of progress on data collection and analysis and what gaps are there and how do we fill these gaps? I'll, I'll, I'll bring Lee in in a moment to say a bit more about some of the gaps, but um, it's difficult to give uh, you the assurance, Dr. Gohani, in, in respect of uh, if we are seeing sufficient progress in respect of high quality data. We note in the report gaps in workforce, primary care, community, social care settings, and on uh, health inequalities. All of these need to be tackled so that there is a complete transparent picture that um, applies really across all aspects of public services, that you um, can be clear on what impact, what outcomes are being achieved from public spending. And at the moment, the data gaps are a real barrier uh, to doing so. Regrettably, there are many reports that I produce, that Audit Scotland produces, that comments on data gaps as being one of the barriers to being able to track uh, outcomes and knowing what, how well public spending uh, is being delivered and what it's actually achieving. Um, so uh, to, to give appropriate balance, we recognise the, the data strategy that is, is pending and the government's understanding of the issues in respect of its response uh, to this report. And we look forward to seeing progress um, so that those data gaps can be filled and there's clear uh, transparency in the delivery of, uh, in this context of health and social care services. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have some more questions on data, and wider data than just workforce planning, uh, led by Gillian Mackay. Gillian? Morning, convener, and welcome, panel. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person today. Um, Audit Scotland has previously recommended that data on waiting times based on the categories in the clinical prioritisation framework should be published, but this has not yet happened. To what extent is there transparency regarding how long patients will be expected to wait and how they are prioritised? We sometimes hear from constituents, for example, that they're placed on a list and they hear nothing more about when they'll be seen or how they'll be prioritised, and this obviously impacts um, patients' experience of the whole of the system as a whole good morning Ms. McKay um, I'll, I'll certainly this time remember to bring my colleague Lee Johnson in to, to support my response the the, the point about the, the the clinical prioritization framework is itself is an important statement of transparent transparency and um, what we haven't yet seen is a company that is uh, managing patients' expectations about how long they'll be required to wait for the for receipt of the services um, or and treatment that they're waiting for. Um, it's a point that we made in our overview report in 2020 and have repeated again um, this year that it's a key component of um, public involvement, public understanding, managing patients' expectations of what they can receive from uh, the NHS. Um, if I may, I'll maybe turn to Lee just to say a bit more about and what we understand of the government's plans um, in this area. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor General. 
Yes, we have made we we made that recommendation last year, and I think as I, as I've said, until we actually see the data attached to that clinical prioritisation framework, it's very difficult for us to make any analysis of the progress that's being made uh, towards dealing with with uh, the backlog. Our, through our conversations with Public Health Scotland, they have assured us that that data will be available later this year. Um, there has been some issues around um, that they're trying to work through with any data at this level around reliability and robustness of that data. And once they've sorted those issues out, they will make it publicly available. So until we have that data, it's very difficult for us um, to make any analysis of, of how progress, what progress is being made. Although what I would say is I do think the, the uh, clinical prioritisation framework is really quite clear um, about how patients will be dealt with and about the way that patients should uh, be followed up to check that they're still at the right level of prioritisation. Um, but of course, whether or not that's actually happening in practice, I guess we don't we, we haven't looked at that in detail. And once we have that data um, around the framework, then it will enable us to do a bit more analysis about the progress being made. Thank you. Gillian, have Thank you got you any do. other questions? Yes, one more if we've got time, convener. Yes, you do. Thank you. Um, the report notes that data on primary care needs to be improved. For example, data on the number of GP appointments carried out is not currently available. How important is it that this data is collected and what impact would this have on how services are planned? You're right in what you say. <laughs> is that it, it, it feels like a, a surprising omission. And I think probably one that patients in hearing that um, recognising that for many patients, their journey starts um, at the GP and then elsewhere uh, as required. Um, so we we make that as part of the, the, the finding and recommendations from the report that there needs to be a, a complete suite of data, including GP appointments, to support planning. And I think especially as part of the, the wider thinking of the care and wellbeing portfolio, the reform of the NHS, that if we are moving to a more preventative model, shifting the balance of care that we've talked about for so many years, um, having a complete suite of data will be central to that, including the number of GP appointments and elsewhere to support some of those uh, reform thinking. We turn and, and look to uh, the, the data strategy as being part of that thinking and seeing what comes of that. Um, and we'll look to, to review that. Um, if the committee wishes to pursue it, it may be that it's with Public Health Scotland or the government um, in the meantime. Thank you. Gillian, thank you. Um, we've got some, some more questions around, around data. Um, Sue? Yeah, thank you, convener. Yes, it might be best, Stephen, and maybe if Lee answers this, I'm not sure, because it's back on that clinical prioritisation framework. And you did mention, Lee, uh, you weren't very sure if you were getting a sense that patients were in that right prioritisation and indeed will know themselves that while they're waiting, sometimes for up to two years, they, their symptoms can get significantly worse and are they progressing to that higher priority level. But I'm also wondering, do you get a sense that when people lose absolute hope that they might ever get seen that they're taking themselves off the NHS list and are we measuring those that are going off to any uh, private providers to have the treatments that way as well. Bring in Lee. We we don't have we don't have that that data either. It's not something that we looked at um, in uh, much detail. And actually, I, I, I would probably just uh, flag. Obviously, we presented the findings of our, of our report to the Public Audit Committee, and they've recently written to the Scottish Government, and it's one of the questions that they've posed within um, the, the letter that they've sent to them, asking for further um, you know, data and evidence. So it'll be interesting, I guess, to keep an eye on that and see what the Scottish Government's response is in terms of how, much, uh, how many people have gone to the independent sector to meet their health needs. Thank you. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thanks. Thank you, uh, convener. And good morning. It's just a quick question about data. You know, we need the data to, to show uh, transparency of information to make sure that uh, we're you know, following the pathways for uh, care and everything like that. But is the data part of a whole data supply chain in that 
It comes from health boards, it comes from IGBs, it comes from our, our local authorities. And like, who procures the data? Is it the government that are providing it for you? Because I get feedback that everybody's so busy churning out data that they can't even get on with their job. And so that's part of like the, the same clinicians that are being, or coordinators of care, are being asked to provide data when really what they want to do is get people onto a uh, waiting list, get them into appointments, get them uh, moving forward so that they are not just waiting to be told when their hip operation is. Because there's other parts of this data processes about people, uh, uh, I suppose, engaging in a pathway of care. Yeah, yeah, good morning, Ms Harper. You're, you're right, is that there needs to be a balance to be struck between uh, collecting data and delivering patient care. That you know, We don't want to create you know, more bureaucracy than is necessary. Um, but at the same time, I think what we'd like to set out in the report is that the gaps that exist at the moment are barriers to understanding how well uh, health and social care services are being delivered and also looking to the future barriers to delivering some of the reforms that are needed for the delivery of health and social care services. Um, so there is a transparency point, there's a planning point as well, um, but I think also there's a bit of a, a leadership requirement around this too, that, um, and probably only one that the Scottish Government can provide given the, um, the reach into different parts of public service delivery. So yes, this applies to uh, primary care settings, to health boards, to IGBs, and into um, thinking particularly about some of the reforms to the National Care Service, that that also starts off on the right footing of high quality data involving the government and its local authority partners. Um, so I, I agree that there's a need for balance, that it, it's not seen as interrupting patient care in the here and now, but also that it gives um, the right platform for some of the reforms um, and future aspirations. So I um, suppose the, what Audit Scotland need from the Scottish Government is um, different types of data or the, what data is missing, for instance, so that the government provides you with the data that then you can analyse. I, th I think our needs are only one analysis, probably a pretty small part of that, actually, in terms of uh, our assessment. I think what we're looking to point out in the report is the government themselves don't have the complete suite of data that we think that they should have in order to make some of the uh, decisions about the delivery of health and social care services, some of the thinking uh, for reform. Um, our requirements um, will be used to you know, report publicly as we do through our audit work and how well public money has been used and what outcomes have been delivered for public services. But it's not just us. You know, there's clearly, you know, both the government, patients, we've touched on the transparency point um, already, but I think especially the reform all of that needs a complete data set um, and addressing some of the gaps that we currently have. Okay, thanks. Emma, if you'd like to continue on to your theme about prevention and early intervention. Yep. So I am interested in prevention and early intervention and um, Public Health Scotland became fully, um, uh, I guess, functional April 20... Aye, April 20, I think. So... So I'm interested in looking at the prevention aspects. I mean, what what does need to be done more in looking at upfront tackling of uh, preventative actions, for instance, in order to support better public health across Scotland? Yeah, I'll bring Lee in again in a moment, just to say a bit more about, about the plans. I think we would reasonably recognise that the aspirations of Public Health Scotland, that as it was originally conceived, haven't been delivered upon given its role during the course of, of the pandemic that it continues to deliver. Public Health Scotland, as the committee I'm sure will be familiar, was established as a, a joint uh, programme between Scottish Government and COSLA as a way of focusing on prevention and health inequalities. But by virtue of the pandemic, uh, much of that progress has been interrupted as it supported uh, the delivery of COVID-related services. As it emerges from the pandemic, um, that thinking is, is really vital, uh, both in a, in a public health context, but looking to address some of the inequalities in health outcomes that were very clear um, in Scotland and remain the case. Um, and you know, even just in some of the 
statistics that we touch on uh, in today's report about the uh, challenges both in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy um, that have uh, stalled over the course of the past decade. So clear role for that organisation um, to enter into this space uh, and through its work in partnership um, with local authorities and the third sector to make progress in this area. Um, Lee, if I may convene her just to bring her in and say a bit more about um, what we know is uh, in respect of Public Health Scotland's plans. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor General. I get, as, as the Auditor General has already uh, said, you know, Public Health Scotland have been very um, focused on the response to the pandemic. That's been their main uh, focus for the past couple of years. They are starting uh, to look at their future plans and obviously, uh, you know, early intervention prevention, that whole system approach will be very much at the centre of their plans going forward. Um, I think we've commented for a number year of years how important early intervention and prevention is for the sustainability of the health service going forward, and not only the health service, for social care too. Um, but I think, um, thinking back to our health and social care integration report, and we say very clearly there, there is that real challenge about how you move investment from the service delivery to early intervention prevention. And that's the struggle that, 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 that we always see within services. But what I would also um, note is um, we do also in, in our NHS in Scotland report talk about the care and wellbeing portfolio. Um, that the Scottish Government are currently uh, developing. Um, and the intention is that that will be the vision and strategy for the NHS going forward. Um, and one of the key components of that is preventative and proactive care um, to proactively keep people well, independent and in the most appropriate care setting for their needs. Uh, that portfolio is, um, or, or, you know, the development of that is at an early stage, but obviously we will keep a close eye on that. Um, it, it, its intentions are good, but we need to see uh, how it progresses and how it's implemented going forward to see whether more progress can be made in that area. Just a brief supplementary, really. It's um, looking at Public Health Scotland's website. They've got loads of virtual learning opportunities for clinicians, for anybody in healthcare, social care. They've got modules on health inequalities and human rights health and well-being, poverty, tackling poverty, mental health, health at work and public health workforce. So there's loads of learning opportunities for people to log into and look at that. So that's something that is out there and that is available. So I'm interested to know, is, is it something that Audit Scotland would look at as far as uptake of virtual learning experiences and whether who's involved in, in taking that on and I mean or should this government be doing more to help support the Public Health Scotland work to ensure that um, these kind of know, learning environments are, are are taken up by health boards, by local authorities, IGBs, all of that? Um, we haven't uh, set out any plans to do work in that area to analyse the the success and the outcomes achieved from Public Health uh, Scotland's uh, learning environment that it offers to uh, to health professionals um, is something we can take away and have a, have a think about. Um, what I would expect, though, is that Public Health Scotland themselves uh, would have um, a clear idea of the outcomes that are being delivered from the, the offer that it's making through its learning um, channels to, to health professionals. Um, we can see if we have any information um, on that and, and share it with the committee. Um, if we don't, it, it may be a line of inquiry that the committee might wish to pursue directly with Public Health Scotland. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Sue, you have a question on this? Oh, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Convener. Um, how can we monitor, we've spoken there about that preventative agenda and how we shift onto that. How can we monitor the progress on the rollout and the delivery of that preventative agenda and the healthcare and, and, and the process they're putting in place and is there data there to support so it goes back to the data again uh, to monitor that progress um because when it comes down to the outcomes it's just a challenge isn't it we, we hear a lot about it but how do we actually monitor the progress i think that's the key challenge and, and one that 
you know, over uh, past years hasn't been successfully met uh, to track and monitor what outcomes are changing uh, for the people of Scotland, what's being achieved from, from public spending. And if we do see uh, the reform of health and social care services as envisaged, that will require a considerable amount of public investment. Um, the delivery of tackling the backlog will similarly require that. Public in the Parliament will want to be satisfied about you know, what uh, outcomes are being achieved. Is the uh, patient experience improving? Um, are taxpayers getting good value for that investment? Audit Scotland's got a clear role in some of that, but more directly, the government and health boards um, will want to set out very clearly. And, and I think, as I mentioned once or twice, that the um, annual report on you know, tackling the backlog, together with the work of the care and wellbeing portfolio, that will really be the strategic centre of you know, how Scotland will shift the balance of care. Um, to set out that very clearly is what matters, that there's transparency about what comes next. Um, and then, again, this the second question goes back to sort of drawing the parallels with that clinical prioritisation framework. That's something that I've certainly been aware of. And so while the Scottish Government is uh, piloting the prehabilitation for cancer patients, uh, what value would you attach to ruling out the scheme more broadly across the NHS for those that are particularly on those various points in that prioritisation framework and to make sure that people are in good shape when they eventually get to the time to have their treatment rather than being in worse shape? Um, I'll, I'll perhaps turn to colleagues to see if, if, if they're more familiar with some of the, the detail around that than I am. I think I, before doing so, I would just reiterate the point that's been made a couple of times, is that um, everybody who's waiting for services needs to have a clear expectation as to when they will receive those services, whether it's cancer um, or other uh, treatments on the clinical prioritisation. Um, we very clear in our recommendation about there's a key missing part of transparency in doing so that, uh, and we welcome, I think as Leeds mentioned already, that Public Health Scotland is committed to doing so later this year. And we look forward to see that uh, coming to fruition. But again, I'll turn to Lee or, or indeed Derek if they can say a bit more about that. I'll bring in Lee. Thank you. I, I guess I don't have anything specific to say other than obviously, I think what we are seeing is, um, you know, where treatment has been delayed or uh, diagnosis has been delayed, we're now finding, you know, for example, and I know the committee has mentioned the pressure on um, A and E, for example, that people are presenting more unwell than they previously were. Um, so I think any any initiatives, uh, ways of delivering services that we can implement um, that are shown to be a good practice that are evaluated and work well, if we can roll them out um, across Scotland, there has to be benefits in that going forward. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Emma Harper. You have a, a question before we move on. Yep, just a quick sup. I know we, we talked about prevention earlier and um, the, the government did provide financial support for deep end practices to monitor engagement in governing Glasgow, for instance. And, and part of that was to look at um, supporting link workers, um, supporting anti-poverty work, supporting people getting welfare advice. So that's the kind of, um, I suppose, data that we, we have now to show that engaging and supporting deep end practice work. That's something that we can look at and see the value of investing in that particular project. Is that something that we can audit right now? I think that's a, that's a, I'm not familiar with the example, but I, I would, I would recognise that from um, many practices that exist about shifting the balance of care preventative won't just be delivered from NHS spending, the, the connected nature through social care, some of the education spending, um, pupil equity funding that we've seen will all play a contribution to shifting the balance of care, reducing health inequalities. Um, one of the f features of our reporting over, over many years, uh, and particularly, if, I suppose, on the integration of health and social care has been what's felt like at times uh, anecdotal examples of uh, progress um, and not really the, the system-wide changes that will deliver some of the, the what we would hope to quit some dramatic improvements um, and looking for those examples of good practice to be harnessed, shared more widely and benefit um, all of Scotland. 
um, and building on some of the great examples. So whether it's uh, in, in Glasgow and others that we hear about across the country is really, you know, um, gathering all of those and applying in, um, in the right setting. Um, and again, Public Health Scotland and the government will have a very clear role along with whatever changes happen through the National Care Service to make that happen. Okay. We're going to move on to talk about health inequalities. And I, I'd like to take that first question, if I, if I may, particular of interest to us. We're about to do our own health inequalities uh, inquiry. And, and you, your report suggested that you have an overarching strategy to tackle health inequalities. It's not just simply in the, the public health portfolio or the, the health portfolio, but of course it's across all the kind of government portfolios. In terms of, of your work, um, monitoring that kind of strategy, which I think is agreed by, by most people who come in front of us, that it is the way to, to look at health inequality, not just siloed into you know, what happens in our hospitals, what happens in our GP surgeries, but actually what happens in society more general. What kind of data would Audit Scotland be looking to have in order to, I guess, audit that that stra overarching strategy? Yes, it's, so I guess th there's no straightforward answer to that, convener, unfortunately. That, um, I think that we, we've touched on already this morning about addressing some of the data gaps. So having a clear uh, plan to, uh, to do so, and we understand that is the government's intention through the, the data strategy, that will tackle that problem first. I, I perhaps restrict myself to talking in overarching terms about the need for um, a system-wide uh, data to analyse what outcomes are being achieved uh, from public spending. Too often in our reporting, we talk about you know, both not just data gaps, but also uh, uh, gaps in data sharing arrangements. Um, between public bodies, and that, that may be a, a potential area of, of the committee's interest, about given the, the system-wide requirements to tackle health inequalities, don't just exist within the NHS, clearly a role for local government, third sector, integration authorities, um, and uh, education provision, all of which will have a key role to play, but yet the provision and sharing of data <coughs> across different partners isn't as clear as it needs to be. So we'd be looking for a clear strategy, leadership that sets out um, very clearly um, what impact public spending is having on tackling health inequalities. And I think um, I, I don't wish to uh, be uh, blasé about that, to suggest that's a, that's a straightforward thing, but um, it really uh, ought not to be uh, a surmountable problem for us that we can have a, a clear vision, strategy, reviewed, commented upon, reported annually, a transparent plan to track progress. There are many other planks uh, to that uh, as well, and just uh, for the committee's interest, actually, we'll be uh, publishing a report on um, the rollout of Social Security um, in, the, in the next month or so that will comment upon progress, and uh, in that respect, we'll also have a very anticipated impact in the longer term on tackling further health inequalities. In your work, for example, if you were to do something around sort of like the housing strategy or, or tackling fuel poverty, for example, that you would factor in the, the potential health benefits of any spend in that area? Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of the, I suppose, the, uh, the key priorities that, that I have and, sh and shared by my colleagues in, in the Accounts Commission who, who oversee uh, local government spending is to kind of stepping back and thinking what are the, the, the wider impact of the spending upon inequalities. And that can't be done on a, on a silo or, or, or single system basis. Uh, so across our audit work, we look to, to weave that into our reporting to see the impact that uh, multiple strands of public spending are having upon tackling inequalities, and then perhaps broadening it into other themes that, uh, as well. Climate change will be one of those too. So yes, it's very clearly part of our work, Convener. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll bring in some of my colleagues who've got some questions on this. Sue, you have some questions on health inequalities. Thank you, Convener. Just the one question. In your report, uh, you noted that there was no overarching strategy for tackling health inequalities in Scotland, uh, despite the endemic nature of the persistent and acute 
uh, inequalities that exist. And we've heard some of the activities that you're doing there about weaving the strands of spending across different portfolios. But what conversations have you had with the Scottish Government on the need to urgently establish an overarching strategy on health inequalities, which would almost act then as the linchpin as we recover from the pandemic? So again, I'll, I'll maybe bring uh, Lee in, just a bit looking to the future um, as well. So we've um, had regular engagement with uh, the Scottish Government, NHS uh, officials, and, and note both the anticipated work now of Public Health Scotland and also the government's uh, creation of a health inequalities unit um, within uh, the Scottish Government uh, Health and Social Care Directorate and tracking what progress uh, those changes uh, will make. Um, so it's probably too early for us to pass any judgment um, on what that will make, but we do know and, and, uh, and share the ambition that there is a clear strategy for tackling health inequalities. And as we touch on in the report, that some of the... Um, outcomes um, for the people of Scotland will have been impacted very clearly from the pandemic and noting some of the other challenges that are affecting you know, uh, healthy lives. So we're continuing to review this area and it remains one of our priorities. Thanks. I'm just going to check in. Carol, did you have any questions on, on this theme? Uh, thanks, convener. Yeah, as a, quite a new member to the committee, um, you know, all this uh, information it takes a, a while to process it. The thing that I'm quite interested in is, particularly around health inequalities, life expectancy. We've known this for quite some time, um, and I'm wondering, you know, how, how often in the past have we tried? <coughs> excuse me, have we tried to get this kind of data pulled together? Um, you know, ha have we tried to do that before? And what have been the barriers? Do that if we if we have tried to do that. So I'll, I'll do my best to um, set that out, but I think it probably refer back to some of the uh, earlier discussion this morning about data gaps is a clear barrier. Some of the data sharing um, arrangements that exist between public bodies, and also some of the way that we set budgets um, to deliver public services. Um, we've commented in, um, in some of our recent reporting in respect of the pandemic, um, but it applies before the pandemic as well, that we set budgets generally in quite a silo basis of how services are delivered. So there's allocation of a local government budget, there's an NHS budget, um, more recent years there's an integration budget within, but, it's, but as, as the convener suggests that health inequalities will touch on many different aspects of public spending and to be able to be clear about which part of public spending is having the biggest impact on reducing health inequalities isn't as straightforward. So I think there are a number of steps that need to be taken uh, in respect of high quality data and evaluation of what amount of public spending is having uh, the intended outcome before we're going to have a, a complete suite of the necessary information to make those assessments. So a number of steps to take place, Ms Morgan. Yeah. Can I can I just ask in terms of making that transition? Um, you know, we've talked about whose responsibility in the health service and social care. Is there some kind of leadership at government level that needs to really push to get this to happen? Do you think? So we know there are plans in respect of uh, you know, um, to involve a data strategy that, that um, to, to set out how the government plans to tackle the data gaps and then measure the impact. Um, and we'll look to track that through our work, and, and I'm sure that will be of interest uh, to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, we're now going to look at NHS Finance. Evelyn Tweed. Thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, Mr Boyle. Um, you made some very positive comments in your opening statement about how change can happen quickly and effectively as seen during the pandemic. Um, and you noted that the NHS was not financially viable pre-pandemic and COVID, COVID has obviously exacerbated this. Um, you noted the Scottish Government's ambitious plans, but do you feel positive about the Scottish Government's plans? And is the Scottish Government moving towards achieving real sustainability for the NHS? I think it's too early to tell. Um, as, as to whether the um, ambitious plans for recovery will be met. I think we've touched on uh, in the report and through discussion this morning that 
uh, the success of delivering the recovery and tackling the backlog is reliant upon recruiting, retaining, nurturing um, NHS staff. Um, so whilst not to say that the past is uh, entirely predictive of the future, we do point out that historically that there have been challenges to be met. Uh, again, we welcome the government's commitment to be clear, transparent, publish an annual report on its progress, and we'll factor that into our forward work. The sustainability um, of the NHS, you're right, we've said previously and we repeat in this report that um, the model of health and social care wasn't sustainable um, in Scotland um, for, a, for a variety of factors and to use this opportunity for reform um, and that will be built into both the plans around the National Care Service and also the future delivery of uh, NHS based services to shifting that balance of care focusing more on prevention, tackling health inequalities, all of which require uh, multiple strands of work and weaving those together to in a clear, measurable strategy. And obviously, during the pandemic, the Scottish Government has put a lot of money into the NHS. Do you feel that you can comment on how effectively those resources have been spent? We've done some of that work um, already. Um, for example, we've produced um, briefings on both the vaccination um, programme and also on the use of personal protective equipment. Um, through this report, um, we set out the, the scale of change of, of NHS spending um, and the additional you know, £2.9 billion pounds, um, of funding in, in the delivery of um, NHS services. And again, I haven't said it enough, recognising that this was during the course of a pandemic, an emergency footing that the NHS um, remained on. All of that's clear, accounted for, and you know, we've audited um, the finances through the audit of the, um, the Scottish Government consolidated accounts, and, and that's set out um, in that report. Um, what will happen you know, into the future clearly will be is about what outcomes are being achieved in, in the longer term, uh, and that's very clearly part of our forward programme. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to pick up um, just a bit further on Evelyn's questions about how NHS Scotland was not financially sustainable before the pandemic. Um, uh, sort of two, two sort of questions. What steps do you think we could do to make the health service more efficient? But also, what work have you done or seen when it comes to things like silos and pots of money? And an example I give you would be uh, a, a department having a pot of money to employ locums and a pot of money for its current staff. And those that money can't cross. Uh, and so current staff are not paid what locums are paid and thus don't do the, the internal locums. Yeah, to take those questions in reverse, uh, if I may, um, Scotland has 14 territorial health boards. Um, it has a range of uh, national health boards as well, all are providing services uh, in support of or delivery of, of, of patient care. Um, responsibility for the delivery of various strands of that will re reside on a national basis and some will be uh, for the individual health boards. Locums, for example, is a really interesting example. Um, and in uh, reports of last year or perhaps two years ago, for example, we reported on NHS Highland and some of the challenges in a remote and rural setting that that board was having to recruit to for some GP services and some of the very significant additionality that it was having to pay for, for the delivery of those services. Reflections um, are, are, had uh, taken place and we know that some of those costs have been reduced due to some of the work of the board. And I think it speaks to some of the earlier conversation today about um, opportunities to share that learning across Scotland um, and for all of our health boards to benefit from some of the thinking to uh, deliver efficiencies. Really important that that work continues. We know that it happens in places, um, but I think it's also a point, if I'm able to broaden out, about how we set budgets and how we use budgets for services that accountability uh, follows budgets and accountability for the delivery of services typically rests on an individual board basis. 
but the delivery of longer term outcomes um, requires multiple accountabilities. And I think that was one of the conclusions that when we thought about uh, Christie was that um, individual accountable officers across Scotland will be measured upon the delivery of performance for their own organisation as opposed to the delivery of wider outcomes. So thinking about the opportunity for reform of accountabilities might be part of one of the ways to unlock some of the um, more joined up collaborative working that will be required to deliver um, changes in services and shift that balance of care that we think is one of the barriers that, that we're seeing um, at the moment. So there is opportunity, there is a route through this, um, but it will require some, some quite significant thinking and changes to the arrangements that we currently have. And we now would like to ask you about some of your future work, uh, Paul. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, yes, I, I think this morning what's been key to many of our questions and considerations is that scrutiny and that ongoing uh, assessment of the work that's been done in order to deliver uh, change. So I, I suppose as, a, as an opener, um, what future work uh, on health and social care is it Scotland currently planning to undertake? Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, in terms of the our, our forward work programme you know, mirrors, as we hope it always does, some of the, the key challenges that the public services in, in Scotland are facing. Um, we'll continue to produce an NHS overview, an annual um, overview of the NHS um, in Scotland. Um, we'll think carefully about the themes for that this year. I think one, one of the I suppose, observations I would make about uh, this report is that, of course, it's COVID-dominated. Um, previous iterations of the report have probably been more focused on finance. Um, finance is, is, of all, is, of course, always particularly important and relevant to the work of Audit Scotland, um, and we expect that that theme will increase in future years. But I would anticipate, and as I mentioned already this morning, that the recovery of the NHS um, will be very clearly part of um, the report next year and beyond. We'll also be auditing and reporting on progress toward the reform um, of the NHS as well through the work of the care and wellbeing portfolio. Um, and I'll bring colleagues in, in a moment maybe wish to say a bit more, but we plan to undertake some further work on mental health services um, in Scotland. And together with uh, my colleagues in the Accounts Commission, uh, we will be preparing a programme of work as uh, Scotland progresses to the National Care Service um, and, how, and how that will look. Um, I think there's probably an appropriate analogy to some of the work that we did uh, as... Uh, on health and social care integration and continuing that theme. All of these themes, and, and I think it's, as the convener mentioned, that uh, we'll be weaving in inequalities across all of our work uh, and building those themes. And as the last point I would mention is um, uh, climate change. That we look at, touch it briefly in this report, uh, the commitment towards the 2040 target, the 2030 um, interim targets, and looking at the scale of the estate of the NHS in Scotland, um, what changes will be made around that will require some real long-term thinking. All of that's part of our forward programme. Um, in case I've missed anything, I'll just maybe turn to uh, Lee and Derek if there's anything they want to add. I'll bring in Lee first. Thank you, Officer. No, I think I think that's that's covered everything. Where yes, the NHS in Scotland report. I think we do have plans this year to have a real focus on the recovery plan and progress with the recovery plan. Uh, taking a closer look at workforce planning and obviously the new strategy that came out following the publication of our recent report. So we will take a closer look at that and make some assessment of it. We are just in the middle of scoping our mental health audit. Um, this Obviously, we produced a report on children and young people's mental health services back in 2018. Um, and the plans this year is to look at adult mental health services. But we are just in the process of scoping uh, that audit. And as the Auditor General has also said, we had also made a commitment to do a third uh, performance audit on health and social care integration. And again, we, we, that will be a joint report between the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission. And we'll need to consider what the scope of that is going forward, obviously, in the context of the National Care Service um, and, and how we, what, what we might want to look at. Thank you. Emma, you had a question. Yeah, just a, a quick so question. Oh, sorry. sorry. 
Paul, Paul hadn't finished, so I'll um, come to him after Paul. No, no, not at all. Thank you, convener. And, and I'm very tempted now, of course, to go into a shopping list of things that I'd like or just got into the cap, but I'm going to resist that. I, I think just on, on two areas, if I can, briefly, given the... Uh, the pressures that exist in emergency medicine and quite a lot of what we uh, have at this committee and I think more broadly in terms of a &E attendance, in terms of ambulance services. I mean, is there any particular focus that's going to be taken on emergency medicine? Is the first thing, and secondly, this committee has done uh, a, a, is doing an inquiry into uh, pathways uh, into care um, uh, and looking at GP services, pharmacy, uh, and the different uh, kind of levels of service that can be offered. I mean, is there any forthcoming work from Audit Scotland that might help to supplement and, and support that work? So we don't have any definitive plans around um, emergency medicine, but we, we would acknowledge the the challenges uh, facing a &E departments and some of that clearly being exacerbated by, by the pandemic. Um, similarly, in, in, in terms of pathways, some of the innovations, we, we refer to some of the plans that, that are happening around that area in, in the overview report. I suspect that will be the best place for us to comment and, and uh, in the short term, as ever, none of our plans are fixed uh, into the, to, uh, the medium or longer term. We have, one of the, perhaps for the committee's awareness, um, we changed our, how we do our forward planning for our audit work uh, in light of the pandemic. We, w we typically, beforehand, we'd set our plans a year in advance. We'd given uh, years two, three, and four as fairly indicative programmes. We, we needed to be more flexible than that um, to allow we want to report more regularly, different style of outputs. You mentioned yourself some of the briefing papers that we've done. We'll continue with those, and I think that gives us the flexibility to respond to some of the the live challenges facing public services uh, and we'll keep these two areas under review if they're not included in the overview report. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Emma. Thanks, Convener. Sorry uh, for jumping in earlier. It, I won't give you a shopping list either of things to look at, but it is interesting that I asked NHS Highland at the uh, when we had them in about emissions reduction equivalent of mileage that has not been travelled because folk are now doing uh, Teams meetings or near me. Is that something that you would uh, be planning for, especially for like remote and rural uh, working? Um, how does that then support net zero ambitions then? Yeah, very, very clearly we are planning a, a programme of work, a bit like health and social care integration, similar to the National Care Service on climate change, of how Scotland's public services intend to move towards net zero. Um, so many public bodies have made this commitment. What matters now is that they themselves have a clear plan as to how they're going to deliver um, upon their uh, net zero interim and, uh, and long-term targets. You're right, it's, you know, reduction in, in mileage will be one of the factors. Um, and I think it's also touched on already about the estate that public bodies operate and how their buildings can be made um, more efficient to support net zero ambitions too. Um, if, if we don't um, undertake a, 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 a standalone piece of work, and I suspect it won't be, but probably more across all of our activity commenting on, on climate change, um, then uh, public bodies' own reporting should set out themselves how they've been uh, planning to move towards net zero uh, and we'll be auditing that through our annual audit processes. Just to come back quickly, it says we're seeing that more that people are maybe more keen to live in remote or rural areas because they can work from home two or three days a week and then maybe only travel one or two days, whether it's outside of Dumfries and Galloway to the Central Belt or instead of having to drive to Dumfries every day, they stay in Stranraer. So that's uh, where I was thinking about as far as... Um, emissions reduction linked to mileage or the unnecessary travel, whether it's uh, clinicians or or staff that are supporting clinicians' work. Yeah, that's, that's understood. And that will very, and as well as our own work and I suppose the climate change also, but I suppose but the sustainability of services as well, that if there isn't a dominance of attending or living in, in the central belt and perhaps reference uh, NHS Highland that um, there may be a positive knock-on effect about making um, Scotland's remote and rural communities um, more accessible, more attractive places for people to live and work. Um, and we'll think carefully about how we can factor that into our own work about you know, not just suppose, the, the climate change reduction, but also that sustainability point. So one for us to take away. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm going to bring in Gillian Mackay on this specific point. Gillian? Thank you, convener. Um, just to follow up on some of what my colleagues have, have been asking and to follow on from some of the data stuff from earlier on as well, actually, I've been speaking to um, a couple of stakeholders, particularly in terms of the climate impact of um, medicines. Do we currently have, um, in your opinion, sufficient data to be able to assess any climate impacts of the way we, of any changes in um, the types of medication or the uh, the ways we prescribe medication? In particular, I'm thinking about um, the likes of uh, asthma inhalers. The um, the powder ones are infinitely better for for the planet than than the more traditional ones are. Do we currently have the level of data we would need to assess the impacts of changing away from, for example, the more harmful um, types of asthma inhaler? I, I'm not sure we have that, that data, Ms McKay. It's not something we've looked at through our work. Um, I, bef before turning to colleagues to see if, if, if they can add anything, um, I think, again, it's the type of thing that we would expect the NHS themselves to be tracking and monitoring the the, the totality of their carbon emissions, not just they, how they deliver services themselves, but how they're bringing them in from, from elsewhere. Emma, you want to come back in? Did you? Yep. I am interested in the issues around inhalers because it's not just about one measurement of hydrofluorocarbons as the delivery mechanism for salbutamol, for instance. It's about the whole measurement of that bunch of plastic in a dry powder that can be recycled as easily as some of the components. So I think we really need to be careful in how we're just saying we're not going to give people certain inhalers and only give them dry powder, because it's a whole bigger issue than just looking at um, propellants for those inhalers. We're really interested in your future work, climate change. And as the former convener of the Climate Change Committee, we actually asked the NHS about this when we were putting the climate change bill through. through. We were very interested. But I'm going to bring in final question, Sandesh, before, before we let you go. Thank you, convener. I'm not as disciplined as Paul and Emma. Um, I'm, I'm very keen uh, for long COVID to form a cornerstone of work uh, for future work. And the reason for that is because of how little we do know about it right now, but understanding is, 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 is definitely gaining. But the number of people that are affected uh, and the devastating impact that long COVID is having um, so I'd be very keen and wondering what your thoughts are, whether that would be something that you'd be able to do. Not looking at what's going on, how it's going on, what the planning is, how the money is being spent, and actually are the patients getting what they should be getting? Yeah, I'm very happy to, to take that away and factor that into our thinking. I think, as you've seen in today's report, we, we reference it, and, and as, as Lee rightly added, that um, the government's plans... Um, are generally at health board level to support patients uh, with long COVID. Uh, we'd expect that that will be reported clearly on the progress and impact of the, uh, the funding that's been allocated there. Um, but for ourselves, again, as well as clear data on it, definitions, uh, we'll think carefully about how we can contribute to public scrutiny and understanding of that uh, and factor that into our thinking of our plans too. Thank you. I want to thank you very much, uh, Mr Boyle, for your time this morning and, and to Derek Hoy and Lee Johnson for, for the uh, support this morning. Uh, we are going to take a, a break until our next part of our agenda. Thank you.
Good morning, David. Try to speed up some broadcasting. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning, David. Try to speed up some broadcasting. Can you hear me? The third item today is an evidence session on a further supplementary legislative consent memorandum relating to the UK Health and Care Bill. And this is some supplementary legislative consent memorandum Health and Care Bill S6-5C lodged on the 12th of April 2022. And I welcome to the committee Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. Accompanying the Cabinet Secretary, we have Scottish Government officials Sam Baker, Acting Head of Unit of Infected Blood and Abortion Services, Robert Henderson, Team Leader for Intergovernmental and International Relations Unit, Lucy Oren, Solicitor for Food, Health and Social Care Division, uh, thank you for all of you to have joined today. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, I believe that you've got an opening statement to make. Good morning, uh, Convener and Committee members. I hope you're all keeping well and keeping safe. Yes, thanks, um, Convener. I've got a very brief uh, opening remarks that I was wishing uh, to make. Uh, can I thank you again for inviting me to discuss the amendment to the Health and Care Bill regarding the extension of the offences in the Human Tissue Act 2004 and the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006 to cover the supply of human organs outside the UK. This is the third supplementary LCM that I will have placed before the Scottish Parliament for the Health and Care Bill. And I have written uh, to UK Minister Mr Argar expressing my concern about having to make several requests for very valuable parliamentary time to be spent in considering 
this legislation due to the piecemeal way in which this bill and the UK government's engagement with the Scottish government has been handled. The turning to the amendment includes provisions for additional criminal offences where a person who is habitually resident in Scotland or who is a UK national travels outside the UK to either buy or in any way arrange a form of reward for an organ. In my LCM, I have recommended that the Parliament should grant legislative consent to the UK Government's amendment. While we do not have any evidence to suggest that the small number of people living in Scotland who have organ transplants abroad are paying for their organs, the Scottish Government is committed to tackling unethical organ donation practices. So this amendment would help deter anyone who may in future want to consider travelling abroad and paying for an organ, and would also allow progress towards implementation of the Council of Europe Convention against trafficking in human organs. Uh, and with that, I am happy to hand back to you in committee and take any questions you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I, I know you are in agreement with the, the substance of the, on the amendment, but you, you mentioned there about the piecemeal approach. I just want to ask, and one of these uh, things that, th that we always keep an eye on is the, uh, the consultation process with regards to any, any of, of, of these LCMs uh, that, you know, or any kind of statutory instruments that, that, that come our way as a result of, of, of changes in legislation at the UK government. Has there, has there been a, a enough consultation in terms of, of that, that process between the, the two governments? Thanks, I think it is an important uh, point to make because of the way that this LCM uh, has, has been brought forward, or the way this amendment, I should say the UK government amendment, has been brought forward. Uh, and the requirement for an LCM, uh, uh, there has been a very limited uh, amount of consultation, and that is the source of our frustration, uh, frankly. It also then, of course, very much limits the consultation we can have. And so we have had consultation, as you'd imagine, with um, our clinical advisors on organ donation. There is the Scottish, uh, the, the, the national group on on on, on organ donation uh, as well, which we've managed to take a view on. And, and there's not uh, any concerns that have come forward. Uh, I think a principle. Uh, we are in agreement uh, because of uh, uh, what this amendment is trying to do. But clearly, uh, if we had more time, if this was done in a more structured as opposed to an ad hoc way, uh, we would be able to have more meaningful and deeper uh, consultation with uh, a variety of stakeholders. Thank you. A couple of my colleagues want to ask you some questions. Emma Harper. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I suppose my first question is that the, the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006 is, is what we have in Scotland. Does this mean that we will need further amendments to our own legislation in Scotland? The fact that we now have this no. legislative consent memorandum about, uh, I suppose, illegal organ donation procurement, that kind of thing. No, no, no. It shouldn't require uh, anything uh, further. Um, uh, as the amendment uh, lays out, uh, this UK-wide uh, legislation, although it doesn't include Northern Ireland, and I should be—I should have said that in my opening remarks, actually, due to the fact that their parliament uh, is uh, not sitting in and, and they have elections, uh, it wouldn't require anything further from us, uh, is my understanding. But uh, I'm happy if officials wish to, to come in. Uh, if parliament, of course, agrees to this, it should require anything uh, further for us in terms of uh, legislative amendments. But I, I don't know if any of my officials wish to come in to uh, elaborate on that. Just give them the chance to to come in. Sam Baker. I think Sam to wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Sam. Yes, just just to confirm that that that's correct. There's uh, no need for any further amendments. Um, the the UK bill would amend the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006. Um, so no further changes will be required. Thank you for that, just, Emma. Just an, another wee quick question. And so does it mean that if somebody that we thought was on a transplant list for a, a, a kidney, for instance, that they showed up needing anti-rejection medication and seemed to be doing well. So we would assume that, well, they've had an organ somewhere else. So th this supports, the, I guess, the, the, the ability to have better traceability of organ, I guess, organ surgery, procurement, all of that. Um, because if somebody did... Sh um, need a, a, or somebody did have an organ outside of Scotland, then 
anti-rejection medication as part of that uh, treatment following the transplant. So would that be then a trigger for, uh, I suppose, pursuing criminality? Um, I probably be careful here that we, we know there's been small instances of where individuals have gone abroad for uh, an organ transplant. It's mainly been uh, for a kidney transplant. In fact, I have a constituent who's been abroad uh, in the years gone by, um, and uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to suggest, as far as we know, that, that was done in any way uh, unethically. Um, and, and, and so, uh, th there are protocols and processes um, that are in place for anybody uh, who, who uh, to, to, to ensure that we are informed here in Scotland if they do go abroad um, to, to, to get an organ transplant. Um, you are right, of course, though, uh, in the aftercare that then an individual would require after an organ transplant. Uh, in that aftercare here in Scotland, um, uh, there may be things that come out uh, thereafter uh, in that conversation. And therefore, of course, a judgment would have to be made about whether or not, for example, a clinician uh, thought that uh, anything would have to be reported or not because it, uh, it was a breach of the law or, or, or an offence was committed. So um, it doesn't put an onus on clinicians to have to do that. And clin clinicians, I suspect, in, the, in their everyday lives have to make these really difficult judgments. Um, and not that I need to tell uh, Harper that, uh, of course, she understands well, uh, given 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 her background. Um, so, so in some respects, um, uh, this may well be an original uh, bit of information that we'd have to ensure that uh, those who are working on organ donations, organ transplants, and the aftercare, uh, they are aware of this change in the in the, in the law. Thank you. Do you Thanks. have a question? Thanks, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we know now in Scotland that we've got an, an opt-out approach, I suppose, for want of a better word, to organ donation. But what, work, what other work has been done by the Scottish Government to increase the number of organ do donors in Scotland that would then obviously help limit the risk of the commercial dealings uh, for organ uh, tra uh, transplantation? Yeah, I, th I think it's an excellent uh, question because uh, ultimately we don't want anywhere any anybody to have any reason to to want to have to to go abroad. Um, so there's a lot of work being done, and I'm happy to give more detail to this. But essentially, um, if you look through our donation and transplantation plan for Scotland 2021 to 2026, its core theme is to try to increase the availability of transplants. And I suppose what is important for uh, this particular uh, aspect is one that looks to try to increase the number of living kidney donors, because as I mentioned in a previous answer, I think um, the, 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 the instances we are aware of of people going abroad for, for transplants have uh, either, uh, almost entirely been for kidney transplants or, or the vast overwhelming majority have been for kidney transplants. Um, and, and the other thing which is quite key within uh, the work that we're doing is to ensure that we are encouraging people from as many diverse backgrounds as possible to come forward for organ donation, because we know, again, in many instances, of course, uh, uh, people of, of, of similar ethnic background uh, will be a better mix uh, and match, sorry, I should say, uh, for, for an organ donation and transplant to take place. And that actually, hopefully, if we get more people from as diverse a background, would uh, mitigate against the, the need for somebody to, or the, 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 the perception somebody would have that they feel they need to go to another country where there are more donors of that ethnic background in order to get a possible match. So uh, a, a lot of good work going on in this, but I would, I would commend the, 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 the Nation Transplant uh, Plan 2021-2026 to, to, to the member if uh, she hasn't had the chance to, to see it yet. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Cabinet thank Secretary. you. Right. Th thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you also to your um, officials for uh, answering our questions. We'll now move on to the next item on our agenda. Thank you. The fourth item on our agenda is consideration of three negative instruments. The first instrument is the Sports Grounds and Sporting Events Designation Scotland Amendment Order 2022. And the instrument updates the Sports Grounds and Sporting Events Designation Scotland Order 2014, which is also known as the 2014 Order, to properly reflect the current list of grounds and events to which the Act should apply. The 2014 Order also needs to be updated to include football matches in the competition for UEFA, Europa Conference League 
and the order will achieve this. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instruments and made no recommendations and no motions to annul have been received in relation to the instruments. Can I ask members if they have any comments in relation to this instrument? No, nope, nobody has any uh, comments. So I propose, therefore, that the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? No, we're all in agreement. The second negative instrument is the National Health Service Pension Schemes Scotland Amendment Regulations 2022. These regulations implement reform to the National Health Service Pension Schemes for pensions for NHS workers in Scotland. The purpose of this instrument is to close the legacy scheme at the 31st of March 2022, moving all active members to the 2015 scheme on the 1st of April 2022 to ensure rules around additional pension elections and transfers into the existing scheme for transitional members are applied consistently to those previously classed as full protection members. And the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instrument and made no recommendation. And no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Do any members have any comments they wish to make? Sandesh Gohani. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I, I, I note the work that we're doing here um, and the reasons that we're doing it, but I feel that we're not really doing enough when it comes to pensions and the current NHS uh, pension scheme is hindering NHS consultants from doing extra work uh, because they are essentially having to pay to go to work. Uh, and I think what we also need to do, and I'd love it to have been in here, but we need to uh, do an employer's contribution recycling scheme, the same as that we have in Wales, uh, to enable consultants to do more work. And I'd like to see more work on that. And if we could write to Cabinet Secretary about it, please. Yeah. So occupational pensions is actually reserved... To, to, to the UK this government, however, and it doesn't refer to this particular instrument, but your comments are on the record. So, any other questions, any other comments that anyone wants to make? So, I, I propose, therefore, that the commission, committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? The third and final negative instrument for consideration is uh, National Health Service Charges to Overseas Visitors Scotland Amendment Regulations 2022. This instrument ensures overseas visitors from Ukraine who have been displaced as a result of the ongoing conflict can receive relevant healthcare services provided by NHS Scotland at no charge. The Delegated Powers on Law Reform Committee considered the instruments and made no recommendations and no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Do any members have any comments that they wish to make, Sandesh? Thank you, Convener. Um, of note here, I, I see that uh, people coming from Ukraine will be uh, granted about £10,000 uh, to councils to look after the health, and, uh, the health needs. Uh, and so um, is that money being used here in, in this instrument? Um, and is that money ring-fenced to help people from Ukraine uh, achieve the health care needs that they have. That's something we'll need to write to the government about so we can take that forward. Does anyone else get any comments they want to make? No, I think it's very pertinent. I think I, I would welcome this. I think it's the right thing to do um, for the, those people that are going to probably be suffering a, a great degree of uh, trauma as a result of their experiences in, in their home country. So um, I therefore pr propose that the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? No, we're all in agreement. Thank you. Our next meeting on the 26th of April, the committee will consider its uh, approach to an inquiry into health inequalities and a draft report on its inquiry into the health and well-being of children and young people. But that does conclude the public part of our meeting today. Thank you. <laughs>